So this is for your reference, just in case that you don't want to contact me and you can just go through the stream itself. There are a couple of Quizlets that I have found online that's also in the chat. So, you know, do your best. Uh, I recommend that if you can, I think there's one that's got 125 in there. If you can, add to it. That way other classes can be assisted too. Uh, even if it's just like an extra question or two in there. So just a suggestion, you guys do what you want to on it. Uh, I'm not sure if you can access this as far as going in and entering it. I just viewed it just to make sure that there were no uh, test compromise questions in there. But everything looks pretty legitimate and above board, so I highly recommend these. It's not quite complete yet, but you get the idea. Any questions on that? Well, you guys are really... Are you able to hear me? I can now. Okay, good. I was trying to get my mic to work, but it wasn't working earlier. Okay. You're pretty low, but it might be mine. Now let me look at my volume. My, my mic's not that great. <laughs> well, I can turn you up, and also in Discord, you can turn yourself up. Okay, yeah, I put mine to 100%. Okay. And everybody knows that all you got to do is, uh, I think it's, let me try this again. Yeah, it's right, excuse me, left click, and it'll pop up with all these different things that you can do. And it has a user volume for that individual. You can either turn them up or turn them down. Not sure if you were aware of that. Did you guys do some exercising or anything like that? Normally when I have a class, everybody's pretty vocal. Not today, sir. Okay. There's some confusion on if today was going to be a down Friday or not. Oh, okay. Well, that would make sense. <laughs> Had to swap displays here. <laughs> So what we're going to be looking at is continuing on with one Bravo. And I would like for today, I just want to do like an hour or, t you know, hour or whatever we need to do to get a certain area where I want to be for, to, uh, for the next stream. The idea is to give it to you in small chunks. That way you're not overwhelmed with this. So we're going to be looking at signaling formats today. I'd like to get to, I think it's three alpha today before we do the one o'clock stream. So I feel you on the up Friday, but look at it and what's about to happen in the next couple of weeks, which is you're going to have a four day weekend followed by a three-day work week followed by a three-day work week or three-day weekend so that'll kinda smooth things over after next week so we have NRZ, RZ and CDI these are signaling formats that you're going to be dealing with and you guys went through the NSM lab so you should have seen at least NRZ many times so first things first how do you read this number is it from left to right or right to left left to right does everybody agree yes Affirmative. so left to right what happens if I told you that you are incorrect in order to figure out that it's a million you got to go from right to left now that is the common mistake because everybody reads text from left to right perfectly understandable but in our wonderful world of electronics we're dealing with numbers so we always go from right to left that is including when you are drawing either analog circuits or digital circuits even though you will see it drawn from left to right. That is the incorrect way. It should be from right to left. 
When you look at an oscope, you'll notice that it likes to trace from right to left because that's the way it's viewed. So when we look at this particular number, we start from the right. There's your ones, your tens, one hundreds, thousands, tens of thousands, hundreds of thousands, and then you get your millions. Even though we like to say, oh, we, you know, just by taking a glance at it, oh, that's a million. I read it from left to right. Well, yeah, after you had to count all those numbers in there, that's because of your, you know, reading text. So when we get into words, Again, we're doing it from right to left. Now, why does this play an important part? Well, when we're doing digital, it's important for us to understand that as it goes out of the multiplexer, your first number is that uh, one bit. And then the next number is a two bit, the four bit, the eight bit, the 16 bit, and so forth and so on to get to the multiplexers. So you notice we drew our clock pulse underneath of it. Again, just reviewing, because I briefly mentioned it. Uh, when was that? Wednesday? Golly, I can't even remember the days nowadays. So with uh, when you are dealing with signaling formats, you have to send a clock with it unless it's something called self-clocking. We're going to get into that in just a minute. <clears throat> So the first format we're looking at is NRZ. This one is the uh, format that's internal to a multiplexer. Let me try to describe it for you. If you're a computer, you have a clock. That clock, if it's not, you know, whatever your data format is, is going to be sent according to that clock to the multiplexer. Now the multiplexer, no matter what the signaling format, is going to turn it into NRZ. That's the nature of it. I don't know of any multiplexers out there that change it into something else. So that is a common signaling format internal to multiplexers. Now internal to the multiplexers we're going to be looking at two types of NRZ there is neutral and polar neutral has 5 volt potential between the logic level of 1 and a logic level of 0 you'll notice that that bottom statement there it says you need to send a clock cycle along with it so in other words you got two pieces of data that's got to go down that multiplexer line to the dis and in. Why? Because it's not self-clocking. It doesn't, the, the dis and in does not know how to sync it up. With Sir, the I clock, have a question. Go ahead. Um, so, so when you say, when you, when you talk, talk about clocks and clock cycles, cycles mm -hmm. is that the same thing as like, or is that related to like clock speeds and computer components or is that too Well, it depends on, it, it can be re in relationship to it. But when we say a clock pulse or clock cycle, you can equivalent that to just one full wavelength of an analog signal. They're both in that relationship. Now, when you talk clock, how fast is that clock going internally to, like, to say your computer or the multiplexer or the servers? You know, that you know when you start adding all this in goes into the aggregate the aggregate dictates <clears throat> excuse me how fast it's going to be going out and how quickly it gets to the distant end either with another multiplexer or a server or an amplifier or you know just you name it remember now when we're dealing with clock cycles we could be dealing with <clears throat> excuse me either milliseconds microseconds or in, in some cases nanoseconds so how long does it take to get from let's say the US <clears throat> and I play World of Tanks and you can get onto the European server and you can get onto the Australian server the Chinese server the uh, Russian server yeah wild ain't it and you can play with players from different countries but your 
ping rate is ridiculous at times. So you got to have a good connection between where you're playing and the server or whoever it is you're playing against in those countries. So that's that ping rate. That's that delay that you have. So when you're talking clock cycles, clock pulses, yeah, you could have the fastest speed in the world, but depending on the distance determines how quickly you're going to get there. All right? Does that kind of answer your question? Yes. In a roundabout way, right? <laughs> it, just, it just brought back bad memories of living in Alaska. Ah, well, that would explain it because you guys are on a cable system when you send your data out. You do know that that uh, fiber optics has been laid all over the world on the bottom of the ocean. It used to be standard wire connections, but now we have uh, fiber optics. And if you pull up the Google and type in uh, cable for the world, uh, you're going to see a map and part of Alaska is in that cabling section. So that's probably the reason why you have some uh, delay issues. So that kind of reason why you have some issues with uh, your delays in Alaska? Uh, yes, sir. Unless you're I thought it was just the distance. No, it's has everything to do with your cabling. Because, you know, wherever you're at, you got to get to the server, and then you got to get to the cabling that's going to go under or under the ocean, so to speak. And in frigid temperatures, you know, sometimes the um, the contraction of regular wired lines can make it difficult. So when we're looking at NRZ neutral, again, it's not self-clocking. I've drawn the clock at the top, or copy and paste, down below it is the data of the format we want and the signal that we're making is the actual NRZ neutral waveform. You can see we have a zero. We always start from the right and go left. Now if we actually had a one in this section we would go up and I'm going to get to that in just a minute as the reason why I said that. So you can see we have two pieces of data in those clock cycles. Remember now, look at this clock cycle at the top here. That's one complete cycle. So you have a up, over, down, and this is in one clock cycle. This data stays zero because the, the uh, uh, signaling format will be zero. The next one is going to be a 1. You'll notice it doesn't even resemble the clock cycle. So the next data is a 1. Again, does not resemble it. And then you got zeros. So anytime a piece of data goes in, tells you what the format is going to do. In this case, anytime that there's a 1, I'm going to go to the plus 5. Anytime that there's a 0, I'm going to uh, be at the 0. And this all happens in one complete clock cycle for each piece of data. Nice. Yeah, it's kind of crazy. All right, so you have NRZ polar. The difference between polar and neutral is neutral has a 5 volt difference. This one has a 10 volt difference. What is the advantage of the polar? Well, you can go longer distances with your signal without an amplifier. Again, it's not self-clocking, but you have a bigger uh, difference of potential in this case. 10 volts versus 5 volts. You'll notice we kept the same data and it resembles the thing, just difference of potential is the only difference. Again, this is a not a self-clocking signal. So let's go to RZ. Zero, uh, RZ which is called return to zero. There are four different types. You got neutral and polar. Hmm, sounds kind of uh, the same, doesn't it? And then you get into two different ones, which is bipolar and bipolar zero suppression. Now, gentlemen, in the NSM50, you've already come across these two. 
So you see how we are actually going over signaling formats that you've already touched. So let's look at RZ neutral. Neutral again is the plus 5 uh, volts in difference of potential. Again, short cables. It is not self-clocking. So you can see the signaling format. The only difference between NRZ and RZ is it does return back down to zero. Hence the name return to zero. Get it now? Yes, sir. So <laughs> I know it's kind of a pun, but hey. But you can see halfway through the clock cycle, it's going to return back down to zero. And again, another piece of data of one comes in. We go to the plus five halfway through the clock cycle when it returns back down to zero. That's the difference between NRZ and RZ neutral. We go to polar. Again, we're going to have that 10 volt difference. However, this one is self-clocking. That means I don't have to send a clock cycle with in addition to this signaling format. It saves on time. You remember when, uh, was it Wednesday, we went over all the framing bits, the non-information bits? Well, you, that overhead is part of that clock cycle if you've got to send it. Well, in this case, I don't have to send it, so that makes my bandwidth a little bit more efficient in having to send extra overhead. So let's take a look at this. Oh my goodness, does this look like it's clocked. So let's go back up here and say that logic ones are plus five and zeros are negative five. So there you go. So a zero is going to go down to negative five. Again, halfway through the clock cycle, the namesake return to zero comes into play. Well, gee, that kind of resembles this clock cycle. Same with the data of one. We have a clock cycle right here. Another one bites the dust. Anyway, that was bad. You have another <laughs> clock cycle. I liked it. <laughs> hey, <laughs> yeah, it could be worse with my in sync. You know, bye bye bye. I love that. It's my yeah. favorite thing, sir. <laughs> anyway, I couldn't help myself. It, I, I'm full of puns this morning. So, as you can see, every time that we have a piece of data coming in, this particular waveform is going to resemble that clock cycle in either with a positive going signal or a negative going signal, with the zero being returned to zero. So, RZ polar is self clocking. So let's take a look at the other two um, waveforms, which are bipolar and bipolar with zero suppression. Now, bipolar in its name means that when I have a one, I'm either going to be at a plus five or a negative five. The bipolar meaning each time I have a one come in, I will alternate from the last one. So I'm going to look back and check it out and say, okay, if it was a positive, I got to go negative on the next one. This one is not self-clocking. Let's take a look. So when you have a zero, it stays zero, hence the word return to zero, zero, zero. But when you get a one, and like I said before, we always try to start in the positive uh, side of the field here for our first data. So we're going to go into the plus five look at our clock cycle halfway through the clock cycle we're going to go back down to zero hence the name return to zero the next one and here's where the bipolar comes into play is going to go opposite kind of like the opposite of two personalities one is opposite of the other that's the reason why bipolar is in there with this particular waveform so you have a positive one for the first data and a negative five for the next one and that's data and as you can see we got a couple zeros in the, in the array and it doesn't change states gets to another one it looks back and says hey I had a negative five this one's going to be a plus five and so forth and so on now when you guys look at your NSM tech manual you will hear the words a not words 
acronym of Alpha Mike India, which is alternate mark inversion. It's the same thing as bipolar. Hmm. Yes, you uh, came across it, but you didn't play with it because it was not part of the lab. It is in your tech manual. I think it's the T1E1, if I'm not mistaken. But I could be wrong. Which one's T1E1, sir? Uh, I think it's RZ Bipolar, I think. Yeah, yeah. I believe our RZ Bipolar is T1E1. Yeah. Not CDI, because CDI is CDI. Yeah. So the next one, we look at zero suppression. This one actually throws what's called a bit violation. It looks back at the last data of one and says, you know what, I'm going to emulate that. That's going to tell the distant end, hey, I'm in sync, you know, bye, bye, bye. Uh, so the idea behind these zero suppressions is to dictate to the distant end that I'm synced up with my clock, you can sync up with your clock. And that's where the phase lock loop comes into play. So let's take a look at this. You can see that we have the clock cycles. We have a zero data. Okay, no big deal. We have two datas of one. They flip. We have four zeros in a, in a row. Now this is where the zero suppression comes into play because there's several differences and you can look this up under Google. The way that it is written you know, it could say BZS4. Uh, I can't remember how that works out, but I think it's either the fourth zero. After the fourth zero, you throw a bit violation on the fifth zero, or you throw a bit violation on the fourth zero. There's another one in the NSMTO that says HD something or another that says 8. And that one, I do know, throws it on the ninth zero. So it's telling the distant end, hey, before you get started, we have bipolar with zero suppression with the bit violation. Here is the technical term for it. And it will tell you which zero to throw the bit violation. In this case, we're looking at the third zero. The fourth zero is the bit violation. Uh, there, again, there's two or three different formats in the way they spell them out to determine where that zero gets uh, the bit violation. With the bit violation, again, it looks back down to the distant end to see what the last data of one was. Since this is a bit violation, in other words, it should have been in the positive going side, that is telling the computer or the program on the distant end, hey, I got a problem here. This is a bit violation. That means that there was four zeros in a row and that fourth zero is telling me hey I gotta get back into sync bye 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 <laughs> I can't help it I, this is oh, I, I like it sir <laughs> you're good so I think it's great you know you, as you can see it gets back into uh, synchronization and it tells again this is I know my god I see you Corden uh, but it just gives you an idea as to what the distant end is going to be expecting. And you do it at the front end, which is a transmit end, and the distant end, the receive end, is going to put it all back together and help us out. So with that in mind, you have now two different self-clocking. What was the first one? Uh, RZ Polar? Yes, RZ Polar. Next one is RZ bipolar with zero suppression. Let's look at the last one, CDI. This Sorry, one. I had one go, ahead. go ahead. Go uh, ahead. Earlier you said that um, the polars can go farther distances without an amplifier. Is that because of the distance in potential, or the difference yes. in potential? Yeah, because when you think about it, you got a five volt uh, potential here. You send it down the line. How far can it go without the computer going, I don't know if that is a data of one or zero. So you're going to have a voltage drop as you get farther out the line. With 5 volts of potential versus 10 volts potential, let's just say it's 500 feet. That's the max for, or let's just say, the, the uh, neutral. When it gets beyond 5 volt, uh, bef bef bleh, 
beyond the 500 feet, it can't tell if you just sent it a 1 or a 0. Whereas the, the 10 volt difference of potential, it's only going to see that, okay, I only have a plus 4 here and a minus 4 here. Uh, I'm good. I can identify that. So it can go out further. It could probably go a couple thousand feet. It's been a long time since I've looked that up. Again, it can be looked up on uh, uh, Google and determine which one can go farther. Actually, we all know that the neutral is going to go farther than the, or neutral is not going to go as far as the polar. And, and that also applies for the bipolars as well? Uh, that is true, but most of the time with bipolar, you're looking at the transitions, you're not, you know, it, it's going to hit the server and it's going to get reamplified versus the other different uh, sections there, the, the, the difference of potentials. You can say that, but I've not seen it used in that pretense. Normally these uh, neutrals and polars, that's because you're trying to get it to either a modem or some type of multiplexer. Whereas the bipolar NAT's already there. It's ready to go. Crazy, I know, but I've not seen the uh, bipolars used for uh, distances. It's mainly used for uh, different scenarios. And you'll see that when we get into DSU and CSU. Hopefully that answers your question. You can use it because of the difference of potential, but it's not used for that. The other two are with the neutral and polar. So getting back to CDI, this one is so different. If you were to look this up on Google, you will find something. You won't find CDI you'll find something called Manchester diphase. Manchester diphase has a lot of history to it. My suspicions is that CDI is more of our term than anything else in how we use it. CDI uses transitions within a clock cycle. For logic ones, I'm going to transition only one, whether it's going up or whether it's going down. With logic of zeros, I'm going to do two transitions within that clock cycle. You'll notice at the bottom line there, you'll see CDI is self-clocking. Self-clocking. So you have three signaling formats now. You have RZ polar, RZ bipolar with zero suppression, and CDI. Those are the three that are self-clocking. All the others are not. And you can look at the CDI. You can see that with a zero, we got two transitions. Normally, most of the CDI always starts on the uh, first clock cycle, whether it's an up or a down, and in the middle for the second transition. There are times where it can be anywhere in the clock cycle. Okay, just letting you know it can be anywhere in the clock cycle. It's unusual to see it not emulate the clock cycle, but it can happen because it doesn't care on the distant end. It knows that I got CDI coming in here and it is synced up. So the next thing we're going to be looking through is something called Nyquist theorem. Nyquist theorem derives from a gentleman, Dr. Nyquist, who developed PCM. PCM being pulse coded modulation. You've already come in contact with it with the PRIC 150. The PRIC 150 takes your analog voice and converts it into digital. Oh, if you hadn't looked at it or read it in the uh, detailed portion of your maintenance manual, it'll tell you that it is PCM. Now with Dr. Nyquist what he came up with is said you know what uh, most of our voice patterns are between 300 Hertz all the way up to about 3000 K Hertz or 3000 Hertz. Uh, but in this case we have seen some radios go as high as 3400. I've even seen one at 3600. But with Dr. Nyquist you know back in the day he just said you know what let's just keep things rounded 
and then let's just say from 0 to 4,000, 4,000 being the high one, there is a problem at 4,000 above 4,000. They call it sideband foldover. Back then, they had wider bandwidths, but they noticed a problem when you started adding uh, more frequency to the carrier. Now, with this one, he said that, hey, we're going to limit this at 4,000. So we're going to sample this analog waveform 8,000 times a second. So in one second, they've looked at it 8,000 times. How many have ever heard of the software program Audacity? It is a free audio program. Anybody? You have? Have, have you used it? I have. I'll go Adobe Sound uh, booth, too. Okay. Now, in when you export your saved audio, there's a section in there where you can save it as a PCM file or an MP3 file. And it'll tell you everything from 8,000 times a second all the way up to 320K, which they classified as insane. The biggest problem that you have between 8,000 and 320K is the processing speed. If your processor can handle it, then you can do it. It is probably the, 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 the more you sample it, the better it's going to resemble the analog signal when you put it back together. Now with voice, you don't need to do that. You just want to communicate. With the PCM on Audacity, you're dealing with more than just your voice. You're dealing with a lot of music that's in there. So it's good that you guys have heard about it. Now I don't have to bring it up. You guys, it is a free software program, and if you're doing any type of audio, go for it, man. It is really wonderful. Okay, pulse-coded modulation, that's PCM. We're going to take an analog signal, we're going to convert it into an 8-bit code. So the three steps, sampling, quantizing, and coding. First step, we're going to use something called PAM, not Peter Pan, but PAM or even that what is that that little spray that you use in your uh, skillet when you know when you're cooking stuff yes that people yes cooking. <laughs> so there you go sampling we're going to sample that analog signal 8,000 times a second and each one of those are going to be equal in that one second so 8,000 times in one second every little bit is going to be equal from the other one what does it mean by equal equal in time we're going to sample the pulse, how high that is either above the zero line or below the zero line. So when we get into quantizing, we start running into some issues. Well, first of all, what is quantizing? Well, you guys have seen graph papers before. Everything has that little box and everything is equal in distance and in height. So horizontally and vertically, everything is equal. Well, you got to put it in there and assign it numbers, and that is the quantizing bit. Well, with quantizing, there are two different types of those tables. One is the uniform one, that's that graph paper. But the problem that you have when you apply it to that graph paper is you got 127 steps above and 127 steps below. The problem that you have with that signal is it could fall in between those lines because there's no such thing as a 2.5 or a 3.2 or you know any of that stuff. So they have something called quantization errors when it falls in between them. What do they do? They round it. And as you well know, any time you round thing is, what is it, five and above, you round it up, and four and below, you round it down. Well, the quantization errors resemble distortion. That is the problem. So how do you get away from this quantization error since everything is equal on this table? Well they went to something called non-uniform. Now why did they go to the non-uniform? Well, with your voice, they 
programmed it for the masses. Most people can talk between 300 hertz to 3K hertz. Well, if you shove those lines closer, and hence the non-uniform, you're going to eliminate most of your quantization errors. Now, there's going to be some people that have higher uh, frequency voices and people that have lower frequency voices. Can't avoid that. But what they did is they compensated for the masses. So that's the reason why they came up with the non-uniform. Again, you still have... 127 steps above the zero line and 127 steps below the zero line. So if you add, or excuse me, take 127 times 2, what do you come up with? What was the question? The, okay, the question 254. is 254. Hmm. Keep that number in mind. So you have 254 steps in this thing, whether it's uniform or non-uniform. Uniform is going to have a lot more quantization errors. Non-uniform is not going to have as many. Still going to get them because there's going to be places in there. But as you can see, between the you know 16 and to the 127, they start spreading apart. So you're going to have a quantization error. So when you get to encoding, you got to make 8 bits here. So 127 is the first 7 bits. Hmm. The 8th bit is going to represent the negative or positive. So if you were to take an 8-bit word and add up all of the... Uh, the figures of 1, 2, 4, 8, 16, uh, 32, 64, you would come up with 127. That 8 bit where it's uh, the 128, that's where you're going to get the plus or minus. So they were pretty ingenious in how they put this table together for encoding. So. If you take a look at encoding, you can see, starting on the right-hand side going left, here is the 1, there's the 2. You read this all the way over here, and they made a 0 as the plus. I don't know why. It's an engineering thing. Anything that represents a 1 at the 8th bit will be a negative. So that's how they are able to determine between the negative 127 and the positive 127 on an 8-bit word. So three steps. You have sampling, quantizing, and encoding. Quantization errors are caused by the rounding. And with encoding, the 8th bit determines whether it's above the zero line or below the zero line. Does everybody get an idea about that? Feedback is helpful. Yes, sir. Anybody got some issues with that? Speak now forever. That hold your peace. Good. Sounding good and putting it back to play afterwards is going to be fun, right? And Absolutely. That's, yeah. Again, I highly recommend that if you're having some issues, go back and re-listen to the parts in there. All right. So let's go on to frame period. The definition is the time it takes for one frame to occur. Well, what is a frame? Well, a frame is based off of where everything has to be placed. You have a multiplexer, and when it goes through, in this case we're going to look at 24 channels, that one frame dictates how much time it takes for all 24 channels to be sampled all 24. So if you take a look at this and you put the frame period, and this is a mathematical equation, the frame period is equal to 1 over 8,000 in this case, that's 8,000 times a second, and it ends up at 125 microseconds or 0 0.000125. 
Okay, so that's the time it takes to sample all 24 channels in that frame. And you notice back in the last slide slow that we had, we were showing you how each of those frames are put up. Uh, in this case, they only had four channels. Four channels being you would see channel one, channel two, channel three, channel four in those. And if no one you know was in there, you either stuffed it or in async you just let it go and went on to the next one. So those are frames. That's how long it took to get one frame in. When we look at the pulse modulated sample period, in other words, how long is it going to take for me to sample one channel? So you've gone from 125 microseconds, now I've got to sample one. So that's a pretty small area that you're going to measure. Everything is dependent on pulse modulated sample period on the number of channels. The standard multiplexer that they say is 24 channels. In that, you're going to take the frame period, which is at 1 over 8,000, which gave us 125 microseconds. That's how long it took a frame. So frame is big. Pulse modulated sample period is extremely small. That's that one channel. How long did it take me to sample that one channel? So in this case, it'll be 5.28 microseconds or 0 0.000. 00528. That is 5.28 microseconds. So 120, there we go. 125 microseconds uh, to sample all 24, 5 microseconds to sample just one. So you can see it's pretty doggone small. So the two segments here, take a look at the time it takes for one frame to occur for frame period that's big and pulse modulated sample period is the small one at times it takes to sample one of those channels. So we've looked at you know general multiplexing terms, data relationships, types of multiplexing, modes of TDM, demultiplexing, signaling formats, and analog to digital conversion. Everybody cope aesthetic on that? Uh, I guess I have one question. Sure. Uh, I get everything else with the multiplexing and stuff like that, but with like the signal formats, what exactly, uh, um, like, why why are there so many, and like, which one would you use? Would that just be your choice, or? Well, it depends on what you're doing. Uh, you know what the engineer has decided that is the purpose of sending out these particular signals. For example, if you're going to send, uh, let's just say, over the airwaves, <clears throat> excuse me, that you want to send an audio video signal like TV. Well, maybe AMI, which is a bipolar uh, signaling format, best fits the audio and video. Maybe right. if you're just doing uh, analog to digital, you know, for just voice, you may only need NRZ. So it just really depends on what they want to do and how fast they want to send it. For example, standard quality is not, how would you say, the PCM, if you're looking at analog to digital, the sample rate's going to be extremely low compared to somebody that wants to send it in high def, which is 1080, or right. even 4K. So it just depends on what is the application you want to achieve, and then they apply the signaling format to that. Okay, so when we were looking at the uh, the logic ones and zeros on the charts, mm -hmm. it does represent the, um, the quantized signal. Well, what are you asking about? Are you asking the signaling formats? Or are you asking about the PCM? Well, so when we looked at the um, like the signal format, it had like the ones and zeros in the chart, right? And then you had like the di digital waves. So is that after this the uh, um, analog signal got converted and digitized? Yeah, you could say that. Okay. It's a good thing. Audacity makes it pretty simple. If you were to record your voice, you're going to see an analog signal. When you put it in a digital format, 
right. it takes processing speed to put it in that digital format so it's going to be giving you digital signals back so when it demultiplex or not demultiplex but when it decrypts it it's going to go from a digital signal back to an analog signal to what you're going to hear Airman Davis is writing here see what he's got to, to do, ask here great question by the way he's writing a book <laughs> yeah, it's true. Uh, I didn't realize, you know, when when I was <laughs> in the Air Force in the 80s and 90s, I got to see, you know, CDs. Yeah, it's kind of strange. Now it's like DVDs and MP4s and MP3s. Well, I didn't understand it back then because we were still in the analog stage. But when you took a look at your CD player, it would always say things like, hey, I have 8K sampling rate. I thought I was cool. And then out came 16, then 32, then 64, then it, here comes DVDs. So you can see how the progression of technology has come along with this. Yep, kind of crazy. Any questions? Uh, I have a question about sure. the CDI. Mm -hmm. uh, on the format paper we have, it starts off on a one, and I wasn't sure. Like, it doesn't really say. Does it? If it starts off on a one, would it start on a low, like a zero volts or a? All right, uh, let's go back five. up here to to CDI, so I get an idea. Okay, you see this one? Yes, sir. Off on the far right. Is that what you're talking? Why does it go to a uh, a positive? Well, no, on the top it says zero. Okay, that is the data. So I want to represent the data of zero. So with anything that's in electronics, if we're getting ready to draw, it's assumed we will always go to the positive side as our first drawing. Okay. So in this case, we're going to go in the plus five and then halfway through the clock cycle we're going to have this second transition which is the zero volts now you can see let's see if I okay you have a one here it goes up and it stays a one we have another data of one and look where it goes it goes to zero now if if something told us uh, let's just say I'm trying to think of a format that Oh, yeah. Let me see here. Like this one. RZ Polar. Well, the first data was a zero. Well, in our case, anytime it said zero, meant that you went to a negative five. This is one of those unusual cases where, well, gee, I didn't have to go in the positive five because it told me not to. In this case, we had to go to a negative five. Does that kind of clear things up in how we do the drawings? Uh, yeah, because that was the main thing where it was like you either can go down or up, and I wasn't sure if it starts positive or it starts zero, so yeah. that makes sense now. Yeah. The RZ Polar is one of the unusual ones. It tells us if we're going to start off with a zero, we're going to go to a negative five instead of going to a positive five, whereas we're looking at CDI, a uh, completely different entity of... Well, we always want to go positive on our first one regardless, you know. But if it tells us, hey, at a zero, we got to go to a negative five, then we we got some issues here. So did I do that sheet wrong because I went left to right instead of right to left? Okay. That is one of those, uh, it depends on your instructor. Okay, I always try to give you guys the correct information. Some instructors still have the old habit of reading from left to right, so they'll draw it from left to right. Just be advised that with electronics, when you see a signal like this, it always starts from right to left. And when you get out there in the field and you see 
signaling formats drawn, it should be from right to left. And I've seen it where people get confused and they go, no, this, this is all wrong. The manufacturer's like, no, it's not. This is the way it's supposed to be drawn. You're supposed to start on the right and go to left. So unless you're dealing with signaling formats, you'll probably never ever see this again, depending on where you go. Now, if you're going to be dealing with uh, SATCOM, you might see this, or if you're going to deal with anything that has digital networks in it, you might see this come up. So just be aware of what is going on around you. So do what the instructor has instructed you, but at the same time, be aware that uh, I'm trying to get these guys on the same level here of uh, understanding electronics and how to draw an actual waveform. And even the manufacturers on occasion will draw it incorrectly. So just whatever the instructor told you to do, do it that way if they're the ones that's going to be grading it. Make sense? I know, I know. Do what your supervisor says. Kind of crazy. Cleared up? Yes, yes sir. sir. Okay. Trying not to confuse you, but at the same time, trying to get the instructors all on the same page is sometimes a little difficult. So I just go with the... Uh, what did the instructor tell you to do? This is the way. If you if he told you to draw it this way, just draw it that way. But just be under advisement that that's, you know, it's a common mistake out there. All right. So we've finished one Bravo. I would like to get through two Alpha before we shut down for the day or for the uh, lunch period. So we're going to identify basic facts about network management. Bleh. Let's try that again. Identify basic facts about network bandwidth management equipment. Again, RF transmission, you're going to be dealing with multiplexing equipment and dealing with bandwidth. We're going to look at bandwidth allocations, network infrastructure, transmission media, carrier concepts, our carrier system concepts and hierarchy. So here's the way I look at bandwidth allocations. If you look at identify basic facts about it, all right, we have four bandwidth allocations. There are conventional, demand assigned, dynamic, time of day. This gives you an idea of what conventional is. You'll notice that it's fixed rate, bandwidth is wasted. This is the picture of it. You can see that we have two that are being used and two that are not. Even though we got 256 coming out, we're wasting bandwidth. That's conventional. With demand assign, there's an exact amount for each user. The one thing that is nice about this is if you've got 10 users, you figure that bandwidth out for all four, all 10 of those users. If they're not online, that's more bandwidth for you if you want to use it. Demand assign, you can see that each one of these is available. This is what you get out. This is, you know, what you could use. For example, do you use all of your bandwidth? For example, mine is, I think, 25 meg with AT&T. I'm waiting for fiber so it can go up to 100. But do I use 25 meg all the time? No. But that's available bandwidth for someone else that might exceed theirs at that particular moment in time. So that's what demand assigned is. Dynamic. This is all the rates that you put together is going to exceed your bandwidth. Uh, the idea here is kind of works like uh, you guys went through trunking in block five. Well, this is pretty much what it's going to incur. So you can see that we've got, here is your total bandwidth that your users want to use, but this is all you get. So you may have to wait for mm -mm, time, like uh, you guys get on the internet and want to play your games 
during the afternoon and it doesn't work very well. You got to wait till really late at night when everybody's off before you can. That's the disadvantage of having so many of you guys around during the height of the day. Then you got time of day restriction. The way I like to discuss this is you guys have seen um, uh, Lone Survivor where they're trying to call in at certain times of the day. That's your time of day restriction. So you get it as a priority. For example, if your time is here, that's your priority. Can someone else take it? Yeah, but normally if you got something like the Lone Survivor and what they were doing, they have priority. No one can take it. But if you have an upcoming event that is not as um, high up the chain as opposed to somebody else that has rank and they need to do something, they can come down and say, hey, listen, remember that date and time that you needed the, the, the bandwidth here? Well, we're going to put you off and put you over here because so-and-so needs it for an up channel or a down channel uh, directive. So we look at, uh, whoops, ah, it didn't come with the, that's interesting, I thought it did. <clears throat> anyway, the network infrastructure, just remember as long as you got two multiplexers, hey, that's a network. So you can build it that way. EIA, there's two different types, 232 and 530. Uh, I was in the earlier stages of the 232. That's basically your dial-up and the old uh, weird ping that you would get when you uh, tied your computer to the phone line. And then if somebody got on the phone or called you, you would get knocked off the line. This one is... You know, 50 feet to get 56k, 9.6 if it's over, you know, between 500 and 5,000. But the key ones we look at is the EIA transmissions lines. There are two different types. One is balanced. The other one is unbalanced. Balanced is basically twisted pair, two wires. The way they send it down the line is 180 degrees out of phase. So when you come into this line driver, if you're transmitting out this way, you're going to come into this line driver. It's going to separate them. One's going to be, this one's going to be, let's just say, a one signal. And this signal here on B would be a 180 degrees out of it as far as an analog signal is concerned. When it comes back into the line driver here, it puts it back into uh, the original waveform. But as you well know, anytime you're using twisted pair, the further down the line, the more noisier it's going to get. Well, when it has noise on both those signals, when they put it back together, it cancels the noise out, i.e., your noise canceling headphones is a great example of that. So it takes the outside uh, noise that you get and then it puts it 180 out so when you hear noise on the outside it cancels it out and you can't hear anything. Not to be confused with uh, trying to get somebody that you don't want to listen to <laughs> You know, that's, let's say your roommate or whatever, noise canceling headphones are a great thing if that's the case. Next up, you have an unbalanced line. This is your coax cable. This one is the shield is grounded, as you can see, and all your data is on one line. Hopefully, you got a good ground on there to prevent noise from getting on it. It can be a wonderful thing or it can be really bad for you. Next up, for those of you who don't understand DB connectors, I have grown up with them. If you've got an one of the government computers, netbooks, you have a D connector on there. And I think it's a 25 pin. When you guys were dealing with the NSM, 
when you connected the BERTs up to the NRZ port, those are DB connectors. Those are 50 pairs compared to, you know, either 9 pin or 25 pin. And the 9 pin re reminds me of the old 9 pin printers that we used to have. Yeah, technology has got better over the years. EIA electrical characteristics. You, it is very possible that you could deal with negative logic. Negative logic meaning a negative number, in this case a negative 5, as opposed to a positive 5, would be a logic level of 1. I've dealt with them dealing with the old um, OJ314 uh, air traffic control console. They're unique to say the least. So it just gives you an idea sometimes you might see that negative logic versus the original logic that you're used to seeing where a plus is a one and a minus is a zero. Hey, is there any point in here that you might see a ground as a logic level of one? The answer is yes, especially if you're dealing with negative voltages. Next up, we have the EIA 530. This is the improvement of the 232 Charlie. This one you can go farther without the use of the modem. This is what you're going to be seeing nowadays. Next up, we have DTE and DCE. Put in a couple pictures to give you an idea of what the difference is. DTE can be your computer. Your DCE is the modem, just to give you an idea. So. T is a terminal. That's telling you if I'm transmitting the message, I'm the terminal. You know, it originated from this computer. If you're the receiver on the distant end and it comes to your computer, you're the actual terminal, DTE. Your modem, your router, whatever you want to call it, it's going to uh, transfer it to the distant end. That is the DCE. There are four different types of transmission media. You got twisted pair, coax, fiber optic, and wireless. Twisted pair, namesake. Uh, you got Cat5 cable, those are twisted pair. The idea behind it is uh, what is it? The more twists, the less noise that you get on there. Coax cable, needless to say, that's the stuff that you may hook up to your computer if you have it. Uh, you know, for your antennas. It is unbalanced as opposed to twisted pair it is balanced. Fiber optic, this is the newest of the new. Uh, your carrier is the light. Everybody is aware that uh, when you see light, that is RF. And anything above 3K is also RF. RF. Go ahead. Sorry to interrupt. No, um, no. Can you describe the difference between baseband and broadband? And just for reference, I was told yesterday baseband is basically this uh, blocks verbiage for what would be the composite signal coming out of a multiplexer. So is that correct? <laughs> I like to bring up Google. <laughs> yeah. They are. Okay, that kind of makes sense. You got baseband's all digital, uh, analog signal for broadband. Let me try to explain this. Okay. I. When we first started on the 232 Charlies and at that 56K, they had broadband. What did that mean? It mean I had to put a filter on my phone and a filter on my computer. The filter, yeah. Okay, so now you know that's that's broadband. So the filter on your computer took out the voice. The filter on the phone took out the computer. Now I had the old, uh, and believe it or not, Commodore 64 when they first came out, 
and they had a tape drive. And I got curious. I was like, what's on that tape drive? So I put it in my stereo system, which had a tape drive, and I listened to it. Oh, my goodness. Talk about the upper ends of your listening range. I would probably say it's in that between 16 and 20K hertz. It was really high up there. So if you can imagine, voice signals are between that 300 to 3K, and then your computer is higher. So that's what those filters are for, is to block one and let the other one go through. So with baseband, again, you know, you're going to see it in the tisser. You're going to have baseband uh, that's going to be brought in in the back of your tisser, which is your multiplexer, either CDI or NRZ. That is uh, the two that they deal with. And you also have something which is called order wire, but they piggyback it on the baseband. Does that kind of help you out there? Uh, yeah. And it also, like, so baseband is digital transmissions where broadband is more an analog transmission. That is correct. Right. And even and though on analog we could still communicate back and forth, you still had the filters on both ends. So that's the way it went. Hopefully that cleared it up for you. Let's see. I, I get that question often. I should put it in there when it comes back up to baseband and broadband. Uh, but I'm not the subject matter expert for this. I just really love this particular block. Everybody puts me in it. Fiber optic, as you well know, I wish I had it in here. They say they've been, you know, it's going to be brought in here. Uh, in fact, I heard that some fiber optic companies are getting in the terahertz. Not 100% sure, but I thought I had seen a technical advice on that one that they were able to get that much speed in it. I'm like, holy crap. Then you have wireless. Uh, if you're using your Discord, you're probably using your phone. That's wireless. Uh, you can also use it as any type of, and, and they give you, you know, site, satellite, tropo scatter, uh, HF, you name it. Anything that has to do with getting it out over the airways without wires. Here comes the fun part. DSU versus CSU. DSU is routers of two separate networks. Okay? That's D. See where the router is? This is a customer in this LAN. When you call up whoever your carrier is and say, hey, I got a problem, I can't get you know my internet and that, what they do is you see this DSU CSU this is normally in one box so they'll talk to that box and they'll look at your area that is the user side DSU is the user side what does it use look at bipolar and look at this right here AMI alternate mark inversion is the same thing as RZ bipolar again DSU is the user side. Customer loopbacks, alternate mark inversion. When you come to channel service unit, this one looks at the network side. Not to be confused with customer service unit. I've seen that happen before. It's like, no, CSU is the customer. No, CSU is not the customer. It is the network side. You'll see that it is RZ bipolar with zero suppression. So it'll be AMI described as like H, uh, 8 uh, HDS, which is telling you that it's going to throw a zero, I think, on the uh, eighth bit. So this one is self-clocking. The other one is not. Hierarchy. Oh, this is always a fun one. You guys have tripped upon it in block six a little bit. Uh, basically you are uh, taking one channel, putting it in a multiplexer to get 
24 channels put in there to give us 1.55 that gives us our DS1 or T1 and then when we put together I think it's four T1 lines into another multiplexer we're going to get a uh, DS2 but the bottom line here is you start adding multiplexers you may start to run into problems especially when you get into the T4 line uh, it starts developing something called a superscript which I think they finally have solved and this is how everything gets built up to get your faster speeds to include bandwidth so let's take a look at it I found this online you can see that we have 24 voice channels each one of them is doing 64k by the time it comes out you have 1.544 you're going to take four of these multiplexers and put them into this multiplexer to get this out which is 6.312 megabits per second you're going to put seven of these together to get your T3 MUX to give you 44 point uh, I think it's 236 I'd have to go back and take a look at it I tried to clear it up but you get the point as you start adding multiplexers together like a pyramid you start seeing your bandwidth expand and your speed so there we have it gentlemen that's one Charlie I have a question sure so how I understand how um, it would increase like your bandwidth, mm -hmm. but how would that increase your speed? Because wouldn't that wouldn't that same thing have to get multiplexed over and over again? Yes, yes, exactly. So you combine twenty four channels into one. That's an aggregate. When yeah. you get it into the next multiplexer, well, the clocks are going to get well. The clocks are going to stay the same, but your multiplexing has to be faster in order for it to combining into another aggregate aggregate meaning one stream so it just builds upon each other besides bandwidth you're going to get a little bit more speed out of it not a whole lot but a lot more than what you are accustomed to kind of crazy ain't it yes sir uh, everybody's going well, why can't we just combine all these together well there is a like I said there is a problem when you get to the T4 it develops something called a superscript and it becomes errors and you don't want that trying to get down to the dis and in so server farms are developed where they take these multiplexers and combine them to get multiple uh, items. In other words, you got one line coming in, it may go to three or four, or excuse me, three up to four multiplexers, and then you'll have another one doing the same thing. But there, if you've taken a look, if I'm not mistaken, you guys should have seen how the network works. All right. So, for example, my signal here is coming out of my home. Uh, goes to a mile down the street here into a central office at central office you know it may go over to Biloxi and Biloxi sees it it's got to come to here or it may go all the way up to Atlanta it just depends on how the the servers are reacting to all of this so it's it it is a if you were to take a look at the internet as a whole they do have diagrams out there showing you that hey a server may go different areas uh, for example uh, one of my co-workers when she texts us a message it's always an hour behind why because her carrier sees a different place and takes it into the mountain standard times and transmits it that way don't know why but that's the way it's done with her carrier so it depends on what's happening out in the internet it can get very convoluted when you're dealing with this so what is computer hierarchy what do you need to know about this hey just know that you when you start adding multiplexers you're going to start seeing uh, more and more bandwidth to it as well as speed that's all you need to know that clear things up no ma'am maybe yes sir 
All right. So what do we got? All right. I'm going to uh, do fifth. Go ahead. I was just say I had one more question. Go ahead. Uh, so like fiber optic cables or long transmission lines, you know, going from like, say, one state to another server traffic, uh, uh, we're using multiplexing to deliver that traffic. That is correct. It's normally done in aggregate. You know, there may be many different aggregates on that string. Okay. So I just try to clarify. So it's not, multiplexing is not just confined to satellite communications, and that's used. Yeah, it's all used over through it. Yeah. Network, either, right? yeah. It's either wired or not wired. You know, not okay. wired would be, well, let's think about a satellite. I mean, you know, some companies send it overseas via the satellite, but it's pretty expensive. You take a look at it, they may have a user. You know, let's just say a 24-channel multiplexer. You got all these users coming into it. That multi-channel, uh, that multiplexer, then gets sent over to the satellite system, and the satellite uplinks it and sends it to the distant end. Okay, it might only be one multiplexer, or it could be many multiplexers. You don't know. So it's just a. Uh, let's take a look at Alaska. <laughs> I don't think anything has been satcommed out of there unless it's the Air Force or the Army or anything like that. And that's that would probably be very limited. But you guys are dealing with the underwater cable, which is all fiber, from at least from what I understand. And it's gonna, you know, let's just say you gotta get back to the United States or the lower forty eight, that it's gonna come out of Alaska on that cable, uh, into Seattle, and then Seattle's gonna go, you know, get its feelers out and route it to wherever you need it to get it to. It's kind of interesting to take a look at those uh, cabling diagrams for the underwater. Any other questions? All right, let's uh, hopefully I can get through the next two pretty quick. This one's about uh, identify basic facts about principles, capabilities, limitation of multiplexing equipment. What are we dealing with? The NSM50. So when you look at the NSM50, please be aware of where you can find it. It will help you out when you get into the test. Because if you do the control F, there's some places in there where I've seen students that get very frustrated when they go to that control F function. Uh, up comes like 500 different listings. And that's really hard to go through all those listings unless you know where it's supposed to be. Most of your information is in chapter 1 and 2. Your uh, how you were doing the setups and that is chapters three and four. So, are you uh, referring to the technical manual, that is, that is TO or the operator manual from the company? Okay, it should be the tech manual. The, okay. Okay, you guys should have that file, uh, and it'll say NSM fifty, and it, I think it's grand total of twenty nine pages in it. It is. Oh, that was crazy. Crazy. Yeah. Okay. Okay, so just to give you an idea, that NSM tech order, most of it is in Chapter 1 and Chapter 2 with it. So you have purpose of the NSM, functional description, operational characteristics, and NSM configuration. So if you read this first paragraph where it says multiplexes and the second one says demultiplex, gentlemen, if it was doing it in multiplexing, it's got to be doing it in demultiplexing. It doesn't make any sense if you're going to encrypt your data but not decrypt it when it comes back. You get the point? So there Absolutely. are yeah. The the place in the tech order it covers a vast amount of what it multiplexes and it gives you generalities of demultiplexing. So I just wanted to clear that up for you. The next part, 52 meg, 
again, it deals with the hissy port. That is the maximum that the hissy port can do, but it's also the maximum that it can do. Not to be confused, because if you asked, hey, what is the max uh, data rate for the NRZ, you better not be answering the 52 meg. You should be looking in that tech manual to go on, hey, uh, let me see the high number here. So just to give you an idea, there's different max data rates for the NRZ, CDI, T1E1s, and the HISI. So please be aware of that. Uh, just remember we have two operational modes, Legacy Enhanced. You should have been able to see that when you went in to do your programming on the NSM. Because it even tells you, make sure that you're in Enhanced. There is a cut sheet that you guys went through and putting in your figures. If it didn't correlate, you would have got errors on your uh, bit error rate test sets. And this shows you the max data rates for each one of them. I'm not going to go through them. You guys can read them. Make sure that you can find them in your tech manual. Uh, this is the tech manual that you're going to go through. You'll notice it says the TSC-179 ground multiband terminal for the NSM operating characteristics. Again, it should be a excerpt from it describing the NSM. Now you're going to get into uh, block 9 and you're going to be required to already know about the NSM. That's the reason yes. why we put you through it. So there you go. You have the nodal satellite modem. I got one more to do and I'll turn you loose for lunch and then we'll come back Wait. at one. What, what just, just happened? happened? What just happened? What do you mean what just happened? That was it? Yeah, that was it. What I'm trying to do is emphasize. Did you just come yeah. back? <laughs> Almost to the bathroom. <laughs> <laughs> well, so, you know. Were we in the bathroom the whole block? <laughs> Apparently. Okay, Airman Jenkinson. Again, I cannot emphasize this enough. The stuff that you missed today, please go back when I uh, take this Absolutely, video. Absolutely, sir. Go back to see where you missed. You know, you don't have to watch the whole thing, but it's a reference for you to, hey, I missed this part because it went to the bathroom. I need to take a look at this and just scan through it. So let me go over this one, and I'll turn you loose for lunch. Okay, so you have the bit error rate test set, better known as the HST3000. Uh, that's what we're going to be looking at. Yeah, I've used one in the past. This is the one that... Uh, we're using, I'm going to let you in in a little secret. As you well know, everybody likes to go to the newer pieces of equipment, but if it ain't broke, you don't I'll fix it. Fix it. <laughs> there are bit error eight test sets that I have that probably predate you guys. <laughs> I believe it was from there. Thanks. But it just goes to show you that you can find the HST 3000 on eBay, brand new for about three grand. Start to see a picture of why you, when you get one, you don't want to buy another one. If it works, leave it alone. Anyway, yeah, the three thousand stand for how much it costs? That's not the original price. That's the oh, hey, I got, I got a brand new one here still in the box because no one bought it. Their yeah. actual price was like fifty five hundred. Holy moly. Yeah. So what is the BERTS? It's a bit error rate test set. The idea behind it is I need to see if my equipment is doing okay. And it's going to look at the bit error rate to see if it's okay or if it's not okay. The HST, it is handheld. You can do a lot of things with it. Uh, rugged, battery operated. But this is where uh, it does its job. The DTE emulation, you've already, we've already gone over that. That's the computer. It acts like a computer. Uh, DCE, it's going to act like a modem or whatever you need it to do. And then there is monitor. That's where that, hey, what is going on? I can see the outgoing traffic versus the incoming traffic. So I, what you did, I think, in the... 
uh, NSM lab, correct me if I'm wrong there, Sergeant McCusker, you did a DTE emulation along with the monitors. So yeah, it's DTE emulate. They don't do the DCE emulation portion. Both, right. both parts do DTE because it's acting as if you're going from one terminal to another and then the modem in between. Right. So the monitor portion is the bit error rate test set yes. looking at it. So there you go, gentlemen. So we described it. Gave you an idea how it works, the three modes, test modes that it does. So there you have it. Is there any questions you guys came up with? On the bottom. I'm sorry? Oh, sorry. I'm just geeking out over your little banner on the bottom. Oh, okay. Yeah, you can do that in OBS. Yeah, I'm going to have to do that. I like that. Well, it also identifies that if these guys get in here on the RF Transmissions YouTube page, and they're yeah. looking through it, they can identify, hey, this is my class. No, that's great. So that way I don't... Sorry to interrupt, I apologize. No, that's all right. Is there any questions before I turn you loose? Because now's yeah, the time... Yeah, can you go over everything again? No, thank you. <laughs> <laughs> You're having way too much the fun there, Sergeant McCusker. Oh, yeah, sir, you got it. It's Friday. I know. All right, gentlemen. It's been great. We'll great see job, you back Mr. at Mayor. one. Yeah. I'll be back at one for you, sir. Okay. You, we'll see you at one. Be here. Be square. All right? Yes, sir. All right. Take care. Yes, sir. Through you. All right. Where in the world? Okay. Stop streaming. And stop.